of them have a much variety at the bottom of the ocean in all distinct forms. So it's as if my theory can prove that a number of those intermediate varieties must have surely have, surely have existed up to one of his last chapters in Origin of Species. And when he uh, was dying on his deathbed, he said, Not one has been discovered yet. I am so distressed. And uh, his spiritual advisor comforted him. His wife tried to convince him to be a Christian. And as far as anybody knows, uh, he died uh, and agnostic. A rebel against God's word. Uh, where are the missing links? Uh, where are all the fish uh, In between fish, uh, or in between amphibians and reptiles, or in between birds. Um, yeah, National Geographic is going to show reptiles, but we'll look at that in a moment. Their complete absence feels a fatal blow to the general theory of organic evolution. Uh, here's what we might look for. <laughs> oh, if we could only find a sparrow boxer, a cross between a bird and a dog, and oh, that would be wonderful for Darwin. Or maybe we could find a cross between a tiger and an owl. Oh, Darwin would be happy to hear about that. Or a feather cat. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the kid's favorite is this. Yeah. These are just Photoshop things. Uh, but then, what about Petrella? <laughs> <laughs> and the problem for Darwin with all of these is that their complete absence feels a fatal blow to his theory. He said, if these are not discovered in great abundance, then my theory is not true. So he was distressed. Uh, Stephen J. Gould, who has passed away also, um, also is still an agnostic, but I greatly appreciate the truthful things he said. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. <laughs> and he went on to say, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary spiritages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution, because Darwin said, if these are not found, my theory is false. And they have not been found. Archaeology was the most exciting discovery broadcast by National Geographic, and at that time all the other publications were calling frantically and said, do not publish that. It was a fossil from China, and somebody in the publications just decided to go ahead, we're going to get the news out. And so here's what they put in their magazine. The missing link between dinosaurs and birds was Archaeoraptor, but then a few months later, when it was analyzed, the other publications were right. It was a, either a fake, or it was a, something that God just did in the fossil record to confuse people by putting two fossils together. It was the body of an extinct bird and the point of fusion of a dinosaur tail. And, and it was obvious for the later scientists to see that it was fused together somehow. It didn't look like blue, but it could have been natural, it could have been an ex uh, purposeful, but it was not a reptile bird. Now, here's what, um, let me just expand on this, because two weeks ago I said I went, I, I talked to that agnostic young lady in the dinosaur museum, and she showed me a replica of a red bird, of a Archaeoraptor kind of thing from China with feathers. And the feathers were kind of fuzzy on the, on the, the uh, reproduction, the, the model. And, and I said, You know that those aren't really feathers. And she said, Yeah, it would be nice if they are. <laughs> and I said, It wouldn't be bother me if they were. But why do scientists, why are science, evolutionist scientists so desperate to find a dinosaur with feathers? And she said, well, because they have to be falling into birds. And I said, from now on, don't tell your people that don't hear that those are feathers, because they're not feathers, they just look fuzzy. And she said, yeah, they're just fuzzy. <laughs> and so, uh, there's a big difference between the sticks with fuzz on them and a feather. A feather is a complicatedly engineered uh, organ. It's not just an appendage, it's not like our ear. It's, it's, so anyway, 
I compared anatomy and evidence or evolution, or could there possibly be a common designer? When you see diagrams like this, just realize, yeah, it's, uh, uh, we'll look at something about Lucy that will clarify that. Um, Lucy was very famous when she was introduced by Dr. Johansson in the 1960s. He said, oh, this is an ape that stands up. She walks around. When you look at the fossil, uh, how did you know? Because, he said in his article, there were human footprints in the strata where she was found. And when I read this, I thought immediately, could those footprints, they're human footprints? Uh, the, the skeleton looks like a, an ape. Couldn't it be people that ate monkeys? And they just buried the bones or spit them out. Because they were all over the place. They gathered these from a, a very large area to put the skeleton together. Well, there's no knee bones. There's no foot bones, so how do we know the footprints were hers? And there are a few head bones. Well, uh, he just knew that she was uh, walking upright. But later discoveries are this, like with her wrists, had the ability to lock her knuckle walking. And then um, that's what apes do. We don't walk on our knuckles, do we? And also they found out that her feet were banana-shaped like a monkey were uh, swinging in the trees. And the most disturbing thing was the pelvic bones. Human pelvic bones are very different from apes. Apes and chimpanzees cannot walk as we do. They can sometimes kind of stand up for as they move forward, uh, but they can't stand up all the time. Lucy's pelvic bones are similar to chimpanzees. And the early literature started, uh, well, it says the marked resemblance uh, to Lucy, the two chimpanzees is equally obvious. And most scientists were saying, this is just an ape, this is what a chimpanzee type monkey. Well, okay. let's see. Yeah, I'm going to start this over. But this is what the person uh, who was studying this wanted so much to make it stand upright. So this is what, this is what he did. And just look. I'm not criticizing the scientific method here, but uh, this man was so convinced that Lucy had to stand upright that he was convinced that the bone of her pelvis that is a monkey bone was a mistake. And so watch what he did, and this is on YouTube, and he published it to scientists, and then a lot of scientists mocked it afterwards. But, but uh, take a look. Not the ape that stood up. It was a revolutionary idea. We need the whole Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together to cause the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's bones seem to flare out like a chimps. But all was not lost. The truth of us all. Hold it up. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy of plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, 
but after taking the king out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly. Like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Obviously, it doesn't fit very well at all this time. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chips, but a lot like ours. Okay, so I just I just showed that to point out uh, this man was very, very sincere as a scientist, and he sincerely believed what he was doing was right, uh, apparently, when you see his expressions and, and the whole, it's, it's a very passionate presentation that he's doing. So uh, that's why I compare the two models and want us to understand that our interpretation um, our interpretation depends on our bias. And if we don't have a biblical bias, the only thing we have to avoid a sense of condemnation is evolution. Uh, that there's, there can't be a God because I don't want to be judged. So um, I could go ahead and, and cut this fossil up and make it fit together like a human fossil or a human bone. And um, some very embarrassing things were done in the past that sometimes come back into biology textbooks like this, the recapitulation theory. But this was a set of 19th century drawings that still appeared in reference books, are badly misdrawn, and Hinkle was convicted of fraud, and the, but the drawings still persist. And recently I saw these in a textbook. When I was studying Med, I didn't continue in medicine because I was afraid of losing my, my faith. And, and I found a lot of Christians afraid to go into science because they're not sure about evolution or, or creation. Um, so anyway, Hegel's drawings on the top and the actual photos down below, they just don't match up. The truth is that the embryo is not the embryo and the development of a baby is not some just ball of undifferentiated cells, is it? It's a tiny human. And at the, the earliest stage when it starts taking the shape, the fingers are there, the toes are there. Uh, when, when a baby is, is aborted, they don't let the, the mother see it because it looks like a, a, a tiny little baby and if it's past a certain uh, point. And the, the thing that they're doing mostly now in abortions is taking the child when it's ready to be born and it's 100% fully human and just not breathing on its own yet. And so out comes a, a, a dead child and a horrible uh, murder that goes on there. Recent research has found that the differentiation of the embryonic cells begins on the day of conception. That's when it's fully human may even be initiated at the point of the entry of the sperm into the egg. It's fully human, uh, most likely. Because that's how God's designed it. Three things to remember as we finish this section and on to the, the last short section. Evolutionists assume that man has evolved from make like ancestors and then try to make facts fit uh, the theory. They often ignore facts that don't fit or make them fit. Uh, interpretations of the fossil record are full of mistakes, fraud, and controversy. Evolutionists often exaggerate similarities between apes and man and downplay the differences. So is that your grandpa on the right? No, that's not our grandpa. Uh, last, we're going to look at that uh, uh, just real quickly because we're going to get to the questions. Uh, is man uh, created according to God's image or according to Evolution. Evolution undermines our moral values. That's the main thing I want you to take from this. If, if faith is in your past, then uh, we would have the excuse for relative morality. Man sets the rules. But no, we are created in man in God's image, Adam was. And he was given absolute rules by God. He, he was given just one rule. Don't eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me tell you what's right and wrong. And his wife took the fruit and Satan convinced her that it was good to eat. And then he was standing right there and he took the next bite. Um, so he disobeyed. Moral dangers of evolution are happening in our country and around the world with kids bringing guns to, to classrooms or people taking guns to their workplace and they hate somebody. So God says if you hate somebody in your heart, it's murder. And if they're uncontrolled, they'll just kill the people they hate. Why? Why does death happen in the world? Evolution.
evolution has the explanation of death and is over millions of years of suffering, disease, and bloodshed leading to man's existence. That's just the opposite of what the Bible says, that when Adam ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he brought sin into the world, and sin brought death. And that's where sin came from. It was, it was 6,000 years ago. Evolution supposes that the world and human society are improving from a previous primitive condition. But Scripture tells us that the creation is in a state of decay because of the curse of sin. God cursed the serpent. He cursed uh, man and, and woman to not have the perfect world at that time that he had said he had intended for them. Uh, but he's going to give that perfect world to us if we only believe. He will restore it someday because the first Adam ate from the tree and brought death into the world. The last Adam, so in Christ, all will be made alive. Why? The last Adam. 1 Peter 2 34, 2 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. You understand that? God is merciful and good. The God of Abraham, the God of, of Christians, the, the uh, God that other, other religions profess is righteous and holy and all good and powerful. And so he has provided a way for us to have our sins forgiven so that we can live for righteousness by his power. And in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth in which only righteousness dwells. And that's how the Bible ends, comes to the end. Uh, the Apostle Peter, in this section, tells us that the scoffers who deny creation, and including those who believe evolution theory, who are willingly ignorant of the fact that it's so obvious in the fossil record that everything was made by water and out of water. And then he says by those same waters that God created, he destroyed the world that then perished because of the terrible sin uh, that was everywhere and restored the world through one man's family, which was the line of Seth, leading to Jesus Christ. And Noah and his family offered sacrifices and were eventually the the ancestors of the Jewish um, uh, lion, the righteous lion, and Jesus. So heaven, evolution in millions of years, does it really matter? It destroys the basis of comfort and suffering. It contradicts the Bible's teaching on death. It makes the gospel unbelievable. It undermines the authority of the Bible. So, um, I'll give you a moment to write down your questions. And I told you I'll sing a song about my wife. Uh, and our, our fairy tale, um, our, our boss in the Peace Corps asked us, we had a very long honeymoon when we got married in Dumaguete. And we went to see him and he said, when are you going to get serious? We've been on a honeymoon for, we, we went to, to uh, Hong Kong and Japan and, and I got sick so it took longer. And he said, you're living in a fairy tale. And I, I just smiled and I said, yeah, I think we have a fairy tale, not a fairy tale. And that's what this is about. And then I hope you're not offended if you believe in evolution uh, that I make the connection there too. So.